This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices, episode 269, was recorded on April 29th, 2021. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Freelancer.com, the Internet's premier website for putting independent freelance contractors in touch with employers who need their services. No more a quant guru, Charlie McElligot is back as this week's feature interview guest. Charlie says the reflation trade that kind of reversed and started to go away in April is likely to reverse again and come back with a vengeance with still more reflation to come. We'll talk about everything from inflation to bond yields to the market outlook for stocks and other asset classes. Now, Charlie's interview will be a treasure chest of macro insights, but you might be left at the end wondering, okay, so what's the actual trade I put on if I believe Charlie's right about what he just said? Well, to answer that question and more, our own Patrick Ceresna has prepared a slide deck specifically designed to translate Charlie's macro insights into actionable trade strategies. And that's coming up in our post-game segment after the feature interview. And I'm Patrick Serezno. Now, Eric, let's jump straight into that S&P 500. The first reactions in the post-FOMC were generally upwards, but nothing, uh, no crazy big moves. I mean, we're sitting exactly at 4,200 at the time of recording, and it just seems more of the same. Uh, what's, what's your thoughts here on the S&P 500? Really no change from my views in previous weeks, Patrick. I, I think these valuations are crazy overvalued, but everything I see is a crack-up boom in progress, suggesting they're going to get even more overvalued. I, I do think there's a very serious risk that it all comes crashing down someday. I just don't think that day is likely to happen anytime soon. So uh, we'll see what happens here. But as I look at the tape here, it just looks to me like the melt-up continues. All right, well, let's move on to the U.S. dollar, because when we were back in March, it looked like that U.S. dollar was ready to go. We were north of 93 and and seemed like there was some sort of a U.S. dollar rally playing out. But once April rolled along, it's basically been a month of just slow, methodical selling. And we find ourselves under the 91 level on dollar index. Is that it for the dollar in your mind? Well, Patrick, 92 was the key resistance level when we broke through that. As you said, it appeared as if maybe this rally really had legs. Then it reversed and came back under 92. That invalidated that breakout. In theory, that by itself is to some extent, a, a bearish signal that could portend further weakness. But frankly, the dollar's not crashing here either, as some people are trying to say it. It's been weak. It's still holding well above that 89 and change uh, support level that we tested a couple of months ago. And until we get a new lower low below that, I don't think there's any reason to, to say that the trend has changed. We're consolidating sideways, and there's probably going to be plenty of volatility. We're going through a, a phase in history here where monetary policy is um, expanding all over the globe and central banks are in a race to the bottom in a lot of ways. All right, well, let's move on to crude oil because uh, we've been a um, better part of uh, a month or six weeks just trading in a sideways chop, uh, more or less contained between like 58 to $64. And finally, crude oil is breaking out. I mean, we are, we're at 65 plus right now. Uh, is this a new breakout for oil? Are we going higher? Patrick, I do think that we're going higher, considerably higher, in, in fact. You know, as far as what happened this week, the inventory helped, but I don't think it was by any stretch the full story. Crude oil either built 90,000 barrels or drew down about 1.3 million barrels, depending on whether or not you count the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. Normally, we don't count the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, so that would be scored as a 90,000 barrel build. So yeah, it's a build, but it's a tiny built. Cushing, Oklahoma, building 722,000 barrels. Gasoline, building 92,000 barrels. But still, it's drawing down 3.3 million barrels. U.S. production ticking down 100,000 barrels to 10.9 million barrels. But in my opinion, this week was mostly about, not inventory, but Goldman Sachs really spiking the market higher, 
with a research note they put out that says, first of all, they expect $80 crude oil by this summer, and I think they're right about that. But specifically, what they said is they are anticipating a 5.2 million barrel increase in demand in just the next six months. And I can't underscore this heavily enough, Patrick. I don't know if they're right or not, but if they're right, that kind of change, that would be the largest and fastest increase in demand in all of world history for oil. What you have to understand about the oil market, and and certainly uh, the events of just about one year ago prove this out, is when supply and demand fall out of balance quickly, when the supply and demand numbers change quickly, such as the collapsing demand that we had last year, the industry can't really respond quickly enough to either increase the amount of production or decrease the amount of production because the logistics of how oil is produced just dictate that it takes a long time to speed up or slow down the process of oil production. If Goldman is right and there's an increase of 5.2 million barrels, yeah, okay, in theory, it's true that Saudi Arabia and the rest of the OPEC states have enough spare capacity that they could increase production at that point in order to keep up with that demand. The question is how long it would take them to do that and whether they're even inclined to do that or if they're just going to enjoy higher prices. So I think it's going to be really interesting over the next six months to find out whether Goldman is right about this 5 million barrel per day increase in demand. And if so, whether or not the industry is going to be able to respond to it. Now, assuming that the low is already behind us for this correction, it's important to remember we got off easy on this correction and we got off easy, frankly, on the January consolidation before that. What it means is the weaker hands never got shaken out of the market. And that means that someday when we do have a significant change in fundamentals and an oil sell-off, there's probably going to be bigger volatility swings, the, the things that booms and busts are made of. So the setup could be for this increasing demand outpacing supply to result in a huge price spike, maybe a whole lot more than $80 before this summer is over, but it could eventually all reverse back to the downside when the industry eventually catches up and starts producing too much oil. So it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out, Patrick. All right, well, let's move on to gold because uh, gold really uh, put in a, a short-term low in March and has been working its way higher. And currently, we're uh, consolidating. It's been about a week, but we're more or less holding in. I mean, it, we're only you know uh, thirty dollars off of the uh, eighteen hundred highs that were put in just a week ago. Do you think the consolidation goes deeper? Are we still uh, uh, positioned to for higher gold prices? I think that the balance of evidence says the low is probably in with the big caveat that an escalation of 10-year Treasury yields beyond 2% would change everything. And I think gold would really take a beating to the downside if that happened. Right now, though, we've been holding nicely above the previous resistance levels. The uh, short-term moving averages has been acting as support for the most part rather than resistance. The, the one hurdle that we haven't gotten over yet Yet is both the round number at 1800 and the 100-day moving average, which right now is 1804, but they're quickly merging. So right around 1800, Patrick, that's going to be the number. Once we get above that number and stay there, boy, that really confirms a, a bullish outlook. So far, we're, I don't know, 85% of the way there. All right. Well, let's move on to that 10-year Treasury yield because uh, we're trading around one spot six four, but we're uh, certainly off of the lows from last week, and it seems it's rolling all up. Do you think 10-year Treasury yields can make another punch higher? You know, it's going to be really interesting to see that. What I notice this time, what feels different about this to me, is the last time yields started backing up and going through 1.6% to the upside, people were really freaking out and panicking over it. This time around, People are kind of shrugging it off. I think if we do go to a new cycle high above one spot, seven, six, seven, whatever it was last time, uh, I think that is going to really get some people's attention and maybe freak the market out a little bit. But right now, I think people are feeling like, okay, 1.6. Yeah, we've been here before. It ended up stopping just a little bit above this. Not too much further to go. Should be okay. I think most people have the sentiment that 
uh, okay, maybe we don't know exactly what the top is, but we're close to it now. The idea that maybe this is just the beginning and we're barely getting started and we're headed to 3%, uh, that's out of everybody's mind, at least for now. If that comes back, it's going to freak people out and asset markets are going to tank. This week's feature interview guest is Nomura quant strategist Charlie McElligan. Now, Eric, why did we invite Charlie back on the show this week? Well, Charlie has been a favorite with our listeners, and he's also uh, very well respected in the industry. His time horizon is a little bit shorter than most of our guests on Macro Voices. He's really, uh, his letter is written to give institutional traders perspective on what's happening in the market right now, this week, next week, as opposed to, you know, what's happening in the next 6, 12, 18 months. Uh, he does have a longer perspective, so I tried to start there. I wanted to get his perspective on inflation and some of these other things, and then we'll get into the meat of some of this. For anyone who might feel like, hey, this guy seems really smart, but I'm not really clear on what the trade is that I would put on in order to effect what he's talking about, don't miss the post-game segment. That's when Patrick's going to have a slide deck translating some of Charlie's ideas into specific trading possibilities. Well, Eric's interview with Charlie is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Abex Technologies. In addition to sponsoring Macro Voices, Abex also produces Smarter Markets, a weekly podcast that airs every Saturday morning on Spotify, YouTube, and all the major podcast platforms. Smarter Markets brings together the leading minds in macroeconomics, technology, and commodities to explore how capital markets can be redesigned to better serve market participants and society as a whole. Please check out my interview with Todd Buckholtz, former White House Director of Economic Policy and Smarter Markets Season 2 co-host at SmarterMarketsPod.com. Todd will be crossing the bridge to renewable energy with Stefan Weiler, Head of Markets Analysis at Switzerland's Axpo Group, on his first episode of Smarter Markets this Saturday morning. But you won't get Smarter Markets on your Macro Voices feed. You have to subscribe separately to Smarter Markets in your podcast app to receive this free podcast. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Charlie McElligot, who heads up the cross-asset macro strategy team for Nomura Securities, and is very well known for his daily newsletter, which is available to institutional investors. Charlie is well known for the quality of his graphs and charts, and he's prepared a slide deck for today's interview. Registered users will find the download link in your Research Roundup email. If you don't have a Research Roundup email, it means you're not registered yet. Just go to our homepage, macrovoices.com, click the red button that says looking for the downloads right above Charlie's picture. Charlie, it's been way too long. Great to have you back on the program. As we get started, I want to start with a, a trend we're seeing, which is all of our favorite deflationists have defected and become inflationists. What do you make of this trend where suddenly everybody's an inflationist? It's, uh, it's great to be back and speaking with you all again. Look, this is something that I think for the last you know, two years, uh, two, three years worth of our, our visits, we've spoken about, which was this decade plus regime that I called the everything duration trade the everything duration narrative where you know that post great financial crisis QE response had facilitated this kind of perpetually low yields and flat curves type of a trade and what benefited of course then were were things that had you know high sensitivity to uh, low interest rates and that was you know again certainly everything from US treasuries of course to um mega cap tech and, and secular growth, which is a, a twofold dynamic. One, you know, growth, secular growth stuff is stuff that doesn't need a hot cycle to grow. And in the past decade, we have not operated in a hot cycle, thus the, you know, the, the bull flattening in, in interest rates uh, and, and curves. And further, secular growth stocks, you know, which can grow profits, grow earnings in, in the absence of a hot economic cycle, also, then, too, can have their just uh, their, their valuations justified by such you know impossibly low interest rates, negative real rates, things like that. So that's that kind of double whammy that has facilitated 
what was momentum over the past, you know, five, 10 year period, which was frankly looked like a long bond proxies, long duration, long interest rate sensitives, short cyclicals. And the short cyclical stuff was almost just a, you know, a, a funding short in financials, in energy, and basic materials, industrials to a certain extent, all those kind of, you know, formally known as deep value sectors that we had spoken about, it was going to take some sort of shock catalyst to pivot that that construct and that lazy momentum positioning that had accumulated, frankly, over the course of a decade. And that shock came in the form of this impossible left tail last year, you know, this global uh, growth crisis, this global growth black swan, you know, in the form of the pandemic. And uh, the disinflationary impulse that followed then forced not just, you know, a resumption of full throttled QE and not full throttle QE, but unprecedented QE, unprecedented asset purchases, unprecedented uh, lending programs. But then, too, ultimately, the real tiebreaker here that brought the old deflationistas into the new, uh, you know, inflationista camp was, of course, the, the fiscal stimulus, right? You know, this, this step closer to an MMT world, to a world where uh, government debt is, is, you know, effectively being monetized, uh, helicopter drops, you know, stimulus checks. And, um, you know, we have seen over the course of the past year that gasoline to the fire on the recovery. And once we then knew that, you know, both with uh, a Democratic administration being elected and this, you know, understanding that that meant larger government deficit spending, uh, the fiscal stimulus checks, jobs programs, things like that, plus, you know, this, this new world of anticipating the vaccine pull forward, that you were going to have this real double whammy. And the double whammy is what shocked us out of that legacy everything duration trade into the reflation trade. And obviously, you know, from November of last year, and certainly the Georgia Senate runoffs, which evened out the Senate to help allow some of the administration policy to push through with regards to spending and stimulus. When you added that with the vaccine reflation and the renormalization of the economy, everything is flipped on its head. So it's been a, a cyclicals over seculars. And uh, obviously, it goes without saying, you know, a value over growth trade that has really uh, you know, caught, as I said, a, a decade of legacy positioning flat-footed because people just took it for granted that you know, this was a, a perpetual uh, deflationary phenomenon based on you know, debt, demographics, and, and tech disruption. Something that fascinates me, Charlie, is just a couple of years ago, a few years ago, a 2% yield on the U.S. 10-year would have been considered an inconceivably low number. It couldn't possibly go lo that low. That's impossible. That's what people would tell you. Now we've come full circle to the point where a lot of people are panicking, saying if the U.S. 10-year yield goes over 1.75, and certainly if it gets as bad as 2%, oh my God, the sky is falling. The world's going to come to an end. How do we get here in what I, I know you do a lot of work there in terms of looking at where we are in the cycle with reflation and the reflation narrative and, and, and the overshoot. Where do you factor in the, the trend in Treasury yields? Is, is this just the beginning of something or was that just a false alarm? How do you look at this? Well, I think that, you know, to be candid, the the easy part of this cycle pivot, certainly from you know, moving rapidly from, you know, a still, frankly, expansive uh, economy. Last January, we were in February, where we were printing um, just remarkable uh, economic numbers, jobs numbers, labor and unemployment, you know, really shocking stuff into this hard, hard shock recession, you know, within a month thereafter, as the global economy was forced shut down, that, that, Everything that has happened thereafter is, is per the playbook, right? It's that recession into recovery phase that you get such, yeah, obviously, you would expect once the markets begin pricing in, you know, the monetary policy, you know, forward uh, repercussions. Once the market, certainly in this case, began pricing in the fiscal stimulus repercussions, you got that, you know, short bonds, higher yields, 
long inflation type of a trade to a T. That's what the the back test show from a factor perspective, that it's the pivot out of the recession that you, you know, kind of counterintuitively uh, to a certain extent, because people would say, you know, do I really want to be, you know, long, long banks and, and things of that nature, you know, as we're, you know, sitting in this, this economic quagmire, but that's exactly the time because they're, you know, clearly so sensitive to, to interest rates on this trade out as the market pulls forward all this future growth. And now the thing is, that we've actually, in some of our quadrant work that, that we update on, on a weekly basis, has shown this pivot into the, into the harder part, which, which, again, might seem backwards to some folks on the base level, where we're actually five weeks in a row now of our, of our quadrant metric considered in the expansion phase. And the expansion phase is a win. You know, the expansion phase is where you want to get as an economy. The expansion phase is what helps us digest that idea that you know, higher rates in a black and white world, higher interest rates in a black and white world are financially, you know, restrictive. It's higher, higher interest rates are, are a headwind if you're not still growing, right? If you're not still um, seeing, you know, healthy reflation and not punitive inflation, you know, that context matters. If we're seeing higher interest rates on a taper tantrum when growth is still low and, and inflation is you know counterproductive, say a stagflationary environment, it's a very different risk asset response. In this case, if you're still getting reflation plus higher growth, it makes those higher interest rates far more palatable. And that's why I think you know these scenarios that are trying to look for an absolute level in nominal yields that are saying, you know, this is where the stock market will take a hit, um, you know, I think is is grossly oversimplified. It's far more nuanced than that. But to my point about the, the quadrant turn, and as you see, you know, in, in that slide one where the you know expansion is, is now five weeks in a row of our metric, slide two actually tells a pretty interesting story, kind of thematically, because you move out of that really high, you know, highly cyclical, highly indebted, leveraged, high beta yield sensitive regime that we've been living in, frankly, this past year, certainly from January to March, as reflation was just skyrocketing, you know, that, that was the world that we lived in. So that, you know, that, that long cyclical value, short secular growth type of a trade that now, and this corroborates exactly with what we've seen in April, which is, you know, pretty fascinating. A lot of people have kind of been caught flat footed by this, but April was, you know, a, a, a glimpse of kind of the, the opposite world where, you know, you really had, a situation that ran contra to kind of everybody's, you know, positioning, you know, growth factor is up 3%, right? Secular growth is up 3%. The stuff that, that likes lower interest rates and flat curves, and you've had this tech outperformance relative to cyclical value. And cyclicals are the high flyers, the gear stuff, the economically sensitive stuff that's down actually 3.5% month to date. And that, you know, again, so this runs contra to what we've seen January through March. April has been this big reversal month, this big kind of reverse dispersion month that's gone into the face of, uh, you know, this whole last year's worth of reflation trade. And, and that's what these, you know, slide two is showing you there, that as we transition into expansion from recovery, recovery is the juice. Now you're in the harder part where, again, much more nuanced story. You see, you know, the, the one month forward returns, and this is back testing to 2006, you know, when you're looking at the, the quadrant turns, the one month forward returns as you pivot into expansion are, you know, low risk factor, right? That's a bond proxy. That's kind of defensive, long defensive, short, high beta type stuff. Leverage factor still still works to a certain extent, but there you see, you know, hedge fund crowding, which is really still long secular growth. Size, which is like the mega cap type stuff, outperforms small cap which is this you know, cyclical value type stuff, it's counterintuitive. And then if you look all the way down at the bottom, what doesn't work, the 10-year yield sensitive factor. 10-year yield sensitive factor has been the proxy for reflation. If you look at our risk premia suite, I mean, our 10-year yield sensitive factor is up over the past one year. This is as a market neutral strategy. It's up 96%. But over the course of you know, the month to date, it's down you know, 2.6%. So I think we are currently capturing this transition into a much more 
kind of diversified return story, it's not as easy now as just being short bonds, long inflation, long cyclicals. You're really going to get some chop. And that, you know, we can speak to that later as far as kind of my more uh, medium term, you know, one to three month view. A lot of these back tests tell us that there's, you know, some some chop coming with regards to, to themes, you know, between assets, sectors and industries. Charlie, I'm looking at your newsletter from yesterday where you write a handful of recent back tests of macro sentiment and vol factors makes a case that a view for U.S. equities continues for the next one to three months to risk a chop with thematic reversal risk, i.e. April month to date, which has run contra to January to March based upon a number of studies, which you outline in the uh, newsletter. We, we can't send everybody the newsletter, but give us a quick overview, Charlie, of what you guys are looking at there and what the implications are for markets. Of course. So the first one that I that I spoke to uh, is what we just discussed, right? So the economic quadrant analysis that looks at this transition, this phase pivot from recovery to expansion, you know, really captures. Right? This is what we just spoke about. It's this reversal that we're seeing over the course of April looks to probably continue to a certain extent into May and p- potentially even in June to a certain extent where we've moved from, from this very high beta cyclical value, short you know, secular growth into now this expansion phase. So what it does, I mean, it's, 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 it's counterintuitive. You're thinking the economy's humming now. But what you see are duration sensitives, like low risk, like hedge fund crowding, like mega caps over small caps, that outperforms. And then the economically sensitive stuff, like ISM manufacturing PMI factor, which, you know, again, is long stuff that outperforms and, and trending higher ISM manufacturing regimes and short stuff that, that uh, reacts negatively to that, 10-year yield sensitive factor, WTI crude factor, all that stuff actually become laggards as the cycle evolves. So that's part of this chop, right? It's a thematic chop. It's, it's, you're through the easy money of reflation. And so that's the, that's the first part. And if you, and even, you know, that's on a one month, but even the three month factor for returns, they make the case for, for modest further reversal and, and extension of this secular growth recovery to a certain extent, right? The tech mega cap fang type stuff that does begin to stabilize and get its legs. I would probably contextualize this as, you know, more of a uh, consolidation in this case, just looking at this economic quadrant back test. But then from there, if you start getting into um, some of our other analysis, so we do a, if you turn to, to, to slide three, the sentiment index testing. So what we look at right now is this sentiment index that looks at uh, a number of metrics from you know, momentum, credit spreads, vol indicators, technicals. We have currently are running a score that since 2004, this U.S. sentiment index is 99.6 percentile. Extreme, extreme, extreme high, high sentiment across all of these various metrics, right? And what we wanted to do was then kind of contextualize that or then look at forward returns if you make contingent coming from a really um, kind of a low volatility regime that we've been kind of operating within. And what ends up happening is that you look at the median returns, the one month S&P return on the back test, you see kind of more of this chop, right? The one month forward return is just like 70 bips and no excess return. An excess return, we're just saying we're comping it versus what you would typically expect a normal market to do this does exactly what the market always does. So it's just kind of like this grinding 70 bips expected return when sentiment is this high. But what we did then were to look at such a sustained period of high sentiment. So we tested the 50-day rolling score of our sentiment index when it was higher than 99.2 percentile, which just gave us more data points as you widened kind of the band. And what it showed was, was you know, pretty remarkable. When you've sat in such a high extreme sentiment view for, uh, you know, this 50-day period, you know, kind of approximately two, two and a half, kind of two and a half months of a trading 
trading month. The S&P three-month median return is down 2.1%. And there's actually a negative excess return. So it actually underperforms what you would typically expect the market to do by a significant, uh, a significant amount, which, again, looking at this sentiment index, it tells us that we are probably going to go through this you know, period of consolidation, maybe even a, a slight pullback on kind of a one-month, three-month window, just because we're so overshot with regards to sentiment. And then if you turn to slide four, it's this final study that we did where it's kind of from the, it's from the vol space, right? And, and I was speaking with uh, a lot of folks, a lot of clients uh, who are asking about kind of the ratio of the VIX, which is kind of known as the volatility of volatility versus VIX versus, you know, implied vol. And the ratio of the two is something that a, a number of people um, like to look at. And if you were talking about, you know, two Fridays ago, I believe, you printed a, uh, like a 96 percentile, you know, looking back, you know, well over kind of like 15 year period, you printed a 96 percentile rank, which, which basically says to me, it's the study of really rich tails. You know, I think kind of generically speaking, when I see VIX, it's going to tell me that tails are being bid up or tails are being kind of offered, you know, tails meaning, you know, crash up or crash down types of scenarios. And what this high ratio is telling me, that we have really rich tails versus low kind of base volatility because our VIX 12 month rank is just 2.8 percentile. So what I wanted to do was then look at the forward returns when we've seen prior examples, right? This, this high VIX VIX ratio this rich tails versus low vol, but then make it contingent on this 12-month trailing VIX being really low vol, you know, which is, again, just 2.8 uh, percentile. And what you ended up getting were, were a, number of, uh, a number of points there. And what it showed, it was, again, confirming, right? The forward returns, you know, looking out three months, the average return, S&P return, was down 2.2%. The median return, which you know is kind of my preferred metric, was down one percent, and there's a uh, you know a low hit rate. So if when I say hit rate, it's percentage of the time that it's higher is is kind of you know fifty is is a break even in that sense. It's only thirty eight percent, but almost more importantly, what you end up seeing too, and we did the same analysis with regards to VIX forward returns as well. But I think maybe even more just important than the simple S&P forward return is that you actually, too, see larger drawdowns on average over the next three months. So when you do get those down S&P scenarios, they're down much more substantially than kind of the standard month. Plus, you also see higher, higher base fall if, if you were to look at the, you know, the VIX study, meaning just higher VIX out one month or out three months. So this is, you know, all of these kind of uh, separate, you know, this macro study, this sentiment study, this vol study that we're looking at are really telling me that there's, um, you know, a, a, a kind of rotationary consolidation period as we transition the economic cycle. And that makes sense to me. And, and, and it, again, fits within this idea that, you know, a lot of the reflation easy money has been made. And even though the economy is now in the expansive phase, which is a good thing and can help us digest, you know, financial conditions tightening, that it makes sense now as the conversation with the Fed itself in the next few months is going to pivot to removing some of this emergency liquidity. And that is going to begin not with rate hikes, of course, but with the tapering of, of quantitative easing. And I, I believe that they will start messaging that, you know, probably sometime um, just to begin socializing it in the mind of traders and markets, begin probably starting to talk about the economic data coming in hot uh, and, and looking better, you know, even in tomorrow's Fed meeting, or, you know, I think for, for uh, readers' purposes, that's uh, Wednesday. And then in the months ahead, probably around the June meeting, you know, I think they're going to begin to really start talking about beginning tapering the asset purchases, both with regards to the purchases of treasuries and mortgages.
I should have mentioned that we're taping this interview on Tuesday this week. Our listeners will hear it Thursday, so it'll be yesterday's Fed meeting by the time they hear you say that. Moving on to page five, Charlie, the title here is Nomura's Vol Control Model Anticipates the Potential for Buy Flows into End of Week. Tell us what the Nomura Vol Control Model is first for any listeners who are not familiar with it, and then tell us what this chart means. So very simply, there's a number of strategies uh, you know, anything from, uh, you know, variable annuity products that um, kind of uh, will, will model driven, in this case, you know, target a volatility level that will allocate your your investment into, you know, cash or lower beta or treasuries. It'll toggle that exposure, you know, your risk asset exposure, in this case, just like a pure stock exposure based on the kind of the volatility regime that we're operating within. And, we run a, a, a vol control model, assuming a, a target volatility of 10, that I think best captures, and you could say vol control kind of sits over you know, a number of strategies, variable annuities, uh, a number of CTA trend, risk parity in some ways. All of these you know, go back to this general idea that in the kind of post-crisis market structure that we live in, where Fed and central bank response has been suppression of volatility and suppression of interest rates and maximizing, you know, financial conditions easiness, that that has created an entire world of negative convexity strategies or short volatility strategies. And in a uh, market environment where volatility is low, it allows you to deploy more leverage to hit your kind of you know target returns uh, to hit your allocations, you deploy more leverage onto trending trades until there is a catalyst for higher volatility, and that then will cause you to reduce that exposure, remove that leverage, deleverage. You know anybody who's been in the market in the last uh, you know five years, to, to say the very least, knows that we've had these you know handful of times a year these massive degrossing experiences, you know, uh, for a number of idiosyncratic, you know, macro reasons, anything from the quantitative tightening experiment, which I think still weighs heavy, frankly, in Jerome Powell's, uh, in Jerome Powell's mind, um, you know, having blood on his hands for the very poor uh, communication of the, you know, of, of the tapering, which led then kind of, you know, started kicking off the Balmageddon experience in, in February 2018. So then, you know, the Trump China tariff tweets we experienced over 2019, you know, you had these volatility catalysts that would cause these kind of convexity shocks, these negative convexity shocks, these short gamma shocks. And ultimately, all of these strategies that are built on, you know, this concept of volatility as your exposure toggle, then have to force de-risk, you know, by shrinking books, by cutting longs and covering shorts. So we've just had a number of as these you know, degrossing or deleveraging events happen. You know, with that, you've had a number of momentum shocks. This has been a you know this most recent world that we've lived in, as far as a very trend environment. You know, the the macro narrative holding true, right? You know, long equities, short bonds, long inflation, long commodities. All of those trades have trended really well. That's why kind of CTAs as an alternative strategy have, have done you know quite well you know year to date and, and, and recently. But a vol control model in this case, you know the way that we model it, we look at you know the higher of either one month or three month uh, S and P realized volatility. So right now that would mean that the three month realized, which is you know somewhere around you know 16 balls, is the kind of the trigger that we're looking at. And you can, um, you know, estimate or extrapolate, and we use this as kind of a part of our toolkit with regards to, you know, potential uh, flows catalyst. If you look at, you know, this last month and a half of volatility, of base volatility repricing lower, you've generally seen a significant amount of exposure adding because, uh, you know, real, trailing realized vol has, has calmed from still some of those concerns seen earlier in the year with regards to 
you know, an inflation shock with regards to uh, the implications that could have on Fed policy. Obviously, the last few months, you've had a couple of like headline shocks, but generally speaking, it's been a low volatility environment, stocks making all time highs, you know, the bond sell off stabilizing, right? There was a lot of interest rate concerns that were driving some of the higher vol that we saw, you know, January, February, that is too calmed. So you've seen a, an accumulation in ball control strategies where they've been adding back exposure. That has kind of stalled out of late because you've lost that catalyst. You've kind of had vol, you know, trading a little bit sideways. But now what we're looking at, if I'm looking at that three-month um, look-back period, there's actually two over the next week. There's two really big days that are dropping out of sample. And that's what, you know, slide five is showing you those highlighted you know, green boxes there on the kind of the lower, the lower right. The January 27th down 2.6% S&P day and the uh, January 29th down 1.9% day drop out of sample. And that matters because in this case, if you were talking about kind of tame daily S&P returns over the course of this week, so even just like up 1% or down 1%, if the daily return is in that band for the week, the model estimates $15 billion of buying from vol control this week. If that, you know, consolidated even further, uh, if the daily change were just up or down 50 bips, you know, uh, we'd estimate kind of dictate an, uh, an, an additional like 21 billion or so of equities buying. And that stuff matters. Those flows matter when, you know, you're still kind of, you know, halfway through the earnings period, you know, where uh, obviously you know, volatility has is calm, but so too is trading volumes. Those flows can have an outsized impact. Even though we're sitting here at all-time highs, that type of a flow could be a catalyst later in the week to be, you know, help us break out to a new all-time high, even though the back test that we spoke about earlier still should continue to kind of you know capture some of this this chop where again today you're seeing some you know the secular growth stuff that people were using as their source of funds to move into cyclical value. You know, big tech is again, uh, you know, stabilizing to to a certain extent, and you know, it still matters because it's still a really substantial part of the index. So, you know, I think the tape can hold steady, but you're going to keep getting these days of reverse dispersion, where the last year dispersion meant value was outperforming, and tech and secular growth were the source of funds. Now, for the last month, and I think probably for you know another month or two months. You, you can see the opposite of that. And it doesn't mean the index is going to sell off either. It just means you're going to get these movements under the hood. So the graph on page six is basically showing us for a given change in the market, a, a given size market move in one day, how much buying or selling systematic traders are going to do as a result of that. And it, it, it's very insightful just to look at that chart. Let's move on to page seven, which is the combined gamma per 1% uh, of spot. Give us a little bit of perspective. I know this is kind of a, a complex subject, but our own Patrick Serezna has prepared many of our listeners for the gamma concept. Tell us what this model Model shows and, and what this gamma flip point is that's so important where the game kind of changes at a certain price level. For sure. So, you know, obviously this is something that's it's bread and butter in a world of negative convexity that, I, that I've spoken about in a market structure where you know, exposure is added on low volatility and uh, deleveraged uh, on, on up volatility, you know, dealer gamma matters, right? And what this chart is simply telling you is that right now, you know, S&P futures spot is, is 41.72. That's basically stuck dead solid between the two largest dollar gamma strikes on the board. Like at, at 41.50, there's approximately $3 billion of dollar gamma. Uh, and at the 4200 strike, there's like four, uh, 4.25 or so billion of dollar gamma. And looking at that, that chart on the left, you see kind of the peaking out in the aggregate dollar gamma just above 40, you know, 4,200. But those two biggest strikes have us, you know, somewhat pinned to a certain extent. So I'm not surprised that, you know, on top of earnings, which are almost by definition, you know, dispersion, dispersion events, you know, there's going to be kind of, you know, winners and losers based on positioning and obviously the, you know, the fundamental outputs. 
you have um, a low volatility environment that is being further suppressed by dealers being long gamma, which means that to remain hedged, they tend to sell strength and buy weakness. And uh, this is all based on options that they are long and short to clients. So we're, as you see by that dotted line right there, we are you know, pretty much near like peak of, of you know, the long gamma number where things get interesting, of course, when dealers do get um, you know, relative to the move in spot are, are found to be you know, short gamma, which means that instead of this insulating force that kind of stabilizes and buffers, sells strength, buys weakness, which is you know, vol suppressing in its own right, you actually have this accelerant dynamic. And that's where you know, uh, the fireworks happen. You get a macro shock causing spot to move, you know, maybe some sort of deleveraging event, or maybe that's associated with uh, a trend reversal, you know, a short-term trend metric uh, breaks and reverses, and you can see, see, you know, some sort of systematic selling. When dealers get caught in a short gamma dynamic, they're pressing moves. So they're buying the market the higher it goes, or they're selling the lower it goes to remain hedged. And that's where you get, you know, these massive kind of one, two day moves uh, of the past few years, because we've frankly had, you know, a pretty remarkable number of macro catalysts into what has been, generally speaking, kind of a low volatility um, exposure adding type of a, a, a of an environment. But then you get these, you know, these stop outs, you get these deleveraging events, you get these, you know, vol events. And you get the opposite. Oftentimes, it does so, it has happened, where you get our, you know, a gamma flip level that corroborates with like a CTA trend deleveraging level, you know, whether it's a, you know, a short term time horizon signal flipping from buy to sell, uh, you know, two weeks, one month, three months, something like that. When those two points, when a, you know, a CTA deleveraging level hits or a releveraging level hits, when that also occurs alongside you know, a, a gamma flip level, that's where, that's where stuff gets really hot and heavy. Right now, in this case, we are still in a pretty you know, comfortably long gamma dynamic, which is why it doesn't feel like the tape is moving. And yes, we're you know, sitting near all-time highs, but you're getting kind of 20, 30 bit you know, 10, 20, 30 bit moves a day. And most of the movement to kind of the point of everything we've spoken about is really about thematics and dispersion, sector versus sector, uh, factor versus factor, risk premium versus risk premium. That's where so much of the move has happened because it's been, uh, it's been a, a macro regime pivot from this old world of everything duration and disinflation to, um, you know, to this, uh, you know, footing change towards a more reflationary world. Obviously, right now, the message of the, you know, the earlier conversation was that that cycle is beginning to pivot to something more mature into this expansion phase. But then that too has implications for risk premium, for themes, for sectors, for factors. And for the benefit of any of our listeners who may not be familiar with this gamma flip concept, Patrick Serezna has done a couple of webinars on that. We'll tell you where to find them in the postgame segment. Let's move on to page eight now where you're applying this concept, or I should say where you are using this concept to look at specific data here. Tell us what's going on. You're looking at the gamma on the left and the delta on the right as of 426, which is now basically. What's going on with these charts? What, is, what do the charts tell us? So this is just another way of kind of contextualizing and, and ranking the, the magnitude of this current long gamma positive delta, you know, uh, options, um, options take that we're talking about. So there's about 13 and a half billion of gamma here which is substantial. Again, the peak of that is somewhere around like 4225 in the S&P, but it's just, it's holding a steady. You know, that, that's 67th percentile since 2014 is a pretty substantial gamma position. It's not crazy extreme, meaning if, if we, for whatever reason, saw spot break sharply lower into a gamma flip level, the bigger that that dollar gamma rank would be, would mean that we're going to have a bigger move you know, a bigger shock reversal move in the opposite direction, most likely. In this case, it's big enough to matter, and it's big enough to keep us pinned. The dollar delta is, is from a rank perspective, is a bit more extreme, you know, at, at 89th percentile there, as you see there, 342 billion. But that, you know, that tells you two things. One, 
that the market is long via options. And two, that, that is you know, pretty rational in the sense that we're at all time highs. The trick is if you do see a lot of gamma come off, say as a product of options expiration, you know, this is something that we talk about a ton in the note, are OPEX cycles and flows around OPEX cycles, where, and especially with the growth of like uh, weekly options, and certainly the growth of, even though this is more of a single stock phenomenon over the course of the past year, but the growth of, you know, daily, weekly options usage from, you know, retail, right, where they're almost uh, intentionally trying to create these, uh, these gamma events to get dealers uh, or market makers, you know, sh short gamma by buying deep out of the money, you know, options on short expiration. So there's a ton of convexity there. It can really accelerate moves. But in this case, if we were to have kind of, let's say, you know, some sort of macro catalyst, spot moves down a bunch, it's a pretty big dollar gamma, you know, notional that we're talking about, 13 and a half billion, 67th percentile. If we were to get some sort of a shock where we traded down through that gamma neutral level and went short gamma, then that dollar delta would matter because, you know, that's a lot to de-risk. Is, is what that's telling you. So it's just giving you some like dimensional context to positioning and where inflection points are in, uh, in, the, in the options market. Moving on to slide nine, the title is Thematic and Factor Risk Premia Performance Trends. I, I love your titles. for, for They sound so official, <laughs> Charlie. Tell us what's really going on here. What does this mean? What does it tell us? You know, I, I, I wanted to include this because um, – because it gives you time snapshots in particular. I love this monitor. Our um, Prashant Sundararajan built this with our, our Delta One team. And they give you a real hard capture at the both the duration to reflation trade that we've been in, right? So if you look at kind of the far right, and I sorted this by the year-to-date returns, which are the, the orange header there, uh, second from the right. But, you know, if you just look at index returns, like, there you go. Like, Russell is up 16.4% going into today's trade year-to-date, which is, you know, basically 2x, uh, you know, Qs. Qs are secular growth. Russell is cyclical value, right? Small cap versus mega cap tech. Small cap value, you know, cyclicals versus mega cap secular growth tech. That makes total sense, right? On the one year look back, you know, Russell is up near, nearly 80%. So it's capturing like the market picking up the fact that and getting ready for the next move, even at the peak of the pandemic slowdown, the people knew we would, we were going to have this, you know, artificial recession. And what happens when you emerge from a recession uh, due to fiscal stimulus plus monetary policy plus, you know, unprecedented lending, asset purchases, all that stuff that you get this you know huge economic release and that's why the cyclical value stuff uh, and that's why short bonds and that's why long inflation all of that stuff is worked and that's captured in that you know small cap cyclical value outperformance of, of secular growth tech you see that too just in that next section the factor pairs on the year-to-date basis you know leverage factor which again is, is a, you know a highly leveraged balance sheet so it's kind of like high beta long high beta short quality you know, you're seeing a an 80% one-year return in that factor. I mean, it's just massive. And that's, generally speaking, continued to be the case year to date. More, though, about January through March, right? Because you know, I've spoken earlier about how April was kind of a reversal of the reversal. And, and, and similar to that, cyclical value factor. You know, long economically sensitive, short duration sensitive, basically. Now that strategy is up, you know, 47% over the one year and 29% year to date. This stuff that has lagged, the red boxes below on the year to date, is is stuff that was, you know, frankly, bond proxy, long bond proxies, stuff that's been long bonds, short cyclicals, stuff that's been long mega cap, long big cap, short small cap, you know, long defensives, short high beta. All that stuff has been a loser for the you know, the same reasons we just went over. Further down, I mean, the, the middle section there, thematics, as you, as you zoom into this, you'll see. I mean, this just captures some of the speculative frenzy that, you know, could be discussed as a case study for forever, frankly, but of what happens when you add unprecedented monetary 
response plus fiscal, you know, in the form of uh, stimmy checks. And, um, you know, with, with people that have too much screen time, uh, had no sports to watch, and were kind of sick of dealing with, you know, spouses and kids uh, learning virtually from home. This has, you know, led to, you know, the returns that we see here, which, you know, spin offs up 111% in a year, uh, recent IPOs 109%, liquidity beneficiaries um, 99%. Post SPAC merger basket, 87% return over the past one year. You know, everything, all of these, these are long only strategies, but all of these kind of juicy themes, you know, have just seen outrageous returns. If you look further in, though, in that more recent history, you do pick up some of that degrossing, some of that monetization that we've seen certainly over, and to a lesser extent, but you just see smaller magnitudes of these returns. As you know, those retail high flyers have, of course, you know, encountered a little bit of turbulence. Certainly, you know, we're well off the highs of, of the, the SPAC bubble, and some of that stuff is, has really slowed down too. But that really just captures the zeitgeist of the past year and a lot of these very you know speculative, speculative themes. After that, you just kind of drop down to the bottom. The macro pair is the one that I highlighted is that 10-year yield sensitive factor that I spoke to. You know, long, the most extremely economically sensitive, short, the most bond proxy sensitive. And that factor uh, is up 96% over the past year and 27% year to date, even though as you, you know, creep in uh, on the month to date, it's down 3.5%. Because, um, you know, generally speaking, you've seen the bond sell-off stabilize too. And that ultimately has been a very healthy thing, right? I mean, you want higher interest rates, as we said at the start. The Fed is, is seeking higher interest rates if it's reflective of higher growth and inflation expectations. And you, we've checked that box. What you don't want are rate tantrums. What you don't want are rate moves that are so fast and so violent that it causes financial conditions to tighten, that it tightens lending, and that it causes you know, huge fixed income deleveraging events, which, you know, as, as you know, we've said many times over the, uh, over the years in the show, inflation is the ultimate volatility catalyst because, uh, you know, in a world of, frankly, decades of disinflation, we have built this legacy positioning where we've only just reversed over the past year, you know, a part of that. But if you saw fixed income as a core part of most portfolios, where it's been immersed in a 30 to 40 year bond bull market. If you saw that kind of core 60, 40, you know, where your bonds are your low volatility asset class, but certainly within the world of risk parity, and we remember risk parity, what, what happened to it last year under this macro regime change. We remember what happened with risk parity in 2013 during the taper tantrum, where bonds are your leveraged low volatility asset class to counteract the higher volatility of equities. Yeah, then you have real problems uh, just considering the magnitude of fixed income, fixed income assets out there, uh, particularly with the amount of leverage deployed in them by a number of strategies these days. So that's been the difference. Or I think over the course of April, the fixed income sell off stabilized, even rallied, even flattened a little bit. And that has allowed too to see, you know, realized volatility once again compress. And, um, you know, that's what has helped the market, the equities market see those under the hood changes where, again, secular growth, instead of being a source of funds, has too stabilized. Uh, and that's why over the course of April, you've seen that kind of reversal where duration sensitives, bond proxies, secular growth, have actually, again, uh, at least short term, begun to outperform cyclical value again. I think for the next one to three months, that can be perpetuated as the index chops its feet. And then after that, it ultimately comes down to how the market responds to the Fed socializing that ultimately a lot of this emergency liquidity will begin to erode in a very controlled, communicated fashion. But, you know, and that's going to begin with the tapering of, uh, of QE purchases, uh, you know, potentially as soon as the as soon as Q4 this year or, you know, probably the start of Q1 next year. Charlie, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. But before I let you go, I want to talk about where all these slides and graphs and charts came from. 
Almost everything we discussed in this slide deck was taken just out of one day's worth of your daily letter, which is only available to institutional investors. Now, if you're an institutional investor, you already have a relationship with Nomura Securities, and you haven't yet told your sales rep that you want a free subscription to Charlie's newsletter, do that immediately. It's free. You can't lose. It's a guaranteed win. Retail listeners, unfortunately, sorry, you can't have it in and please don't blame us for that. Don't blame Charlie. He doesn't make the compliance rules. He just lives under them like everybody else does. <laughs> Sending repeated emails to Macro Voices saying, Nomura won't give it to me. Macro Voices should instead. Won't help you. Please don't do that. Okay. Charlie, anything else that you want to add uh, for our listeners before we close? Always appreciate the support. You guys have been uh, tremendous to me in my career. And, uh, and it's, been, uh, it's been really nice to make you know, some individual contacts uh, grow off of the platform and your loyal listeners. So looking forward to our next visit, hopefully, as the Fed language pivot begins to pick up here into the summer months, that means more volatility, that means more trading opportunities, and we can circle back in a few months from here and, and go over some of those changes. We'll definitely get you back on this summer, Charlie, and talk about what's going on. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back right after this message from our sponsor. Freelancer.com is the world's largest crowdsourcing marketplace with over 50 million freelancers and 20 million projects posted in 34 languages and 39 currencies. The future of work is now online. And at Freelancer.com, you can get any job you can possibly think of done over the Internet by a global workforce of skilled freelancers. Whether it be web design, graphic design, software development, writing the copy for this ad, backtesting trading algorithms, or building financial models, no matter what the gravity or complexity of the work, definitely give Freelancer a try. Freelancer.com is used by consumers all the way up to large organizations such as NASA, Airbus, Deloitte, Unilever, Facebook, and IBM. To gain investment exposure to the world of work online, Freelancer.com just listed over-the-counter under the ticker symbol FLNCF and is listed on the Australian Securities Exchange under ticker FLN. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Charlie back on the show. I always love his insights and reading his work. So it's, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun just uh, continuing the conversation about the reflation trade here. He is absolutely a brilliant guy, Patrick. But, you know, as we were recording that interview, I couldn't help but thinking a lot of our listeners are going to be listening to this saying, OK, what's the actual trade you put on in order to capitalize on this or that thing that Charlie's saying? So, Patrick, thank you so much. You have put together a chart deck in response to that exact requirement. Listeners, you'll find the download in your research roundup email. Now, if you don't have a research roundup email, that means you're not yet registered at macrovoices.com. Shame on you. Just Go to macrovoices.com, click the red button that says looking for the downloads next to Charlie's picture, or just above it, actually. Patrick, let's go ahead and dive into this chart deck. What's going on here? All right. Well, so the first part, uh, starting page two, is just asking the question, has that reflation trade started up again? And so we heard Charlie talking about that. And I wanted to give a little bit of context of, of what happens during a reflation cycle and where we paused in this last cycle. So back in the post-election period in November, we saw a big startup of the reflation trade. We saw uh, the U.S. dollar weakening during that cycle. And then like we can see on page three, we have had a, the start of a pretty significant commodity boom, or at least a meaningful rally that lasted all the way into late February, early March. And that was where we saw the reflation trade pause. And so up until uh, late February, being long many of the cyclicals, being long value, being long financials, uh, being short bonds, all of these things were an easy trade. And what we saw was that that uh, throughout the month of March and into uh, the early part of April, that all paused and reversed. And so the, the first chart is just showing that the commodity cycle. Now, we recently 
in April saw the beginning of the start of a new upturn in the commodity cycle. And even though energy just broke out, we've seen a lot of commodities in full bull mode, everything from grains to lumber, copper breaking to fresh highs. So uh, the commodity market's been hot for over a month and crude oil's just kind of joining the party here a little bit later. And so to kind of uh, also point that out is that when we look on that chart of the 10-year treasury yield, which is something when you talk about always in the market wrap, at the beginning, we saw at the same time that being long uh, rates and, and short bonds has really been the trade during that reflation cycle, and uh, and that also stalled out in that early March cycle. and And so the question really that we now are looking at, and what Charlie was even talking about, is that has this little one month pause that we've seen throughout the month of March into April was that just exactly that a pause, and are we seeing the resumption of this reflation trade. And if that's the case and commodities are, are putting in the transitory inflation is coming into the uh, into the system, are we going to see that pressure the yields higher? And are we going to see another round of weakness in those uh, treasury bonds? Patrick, moving on to slide five, we've got the value over momentum factor. What is this chart telling us? Well, uh, one of the things that uh, Charlie was talking about as well was the fact that prior to the start of the reflation trade, prior to November, for years, momentum and growth, and particularly a lot of those uh, legacy FANG stocks, were materially outperforming the entire marketplace. And one of the, the biggest things that we've seen occur once the reflation trade started up was the fact that value started to outperform momentum. And we saw, uh, you know, everything from consumer staples to bond proxies, high dividend paying securities were doing incredibly well, small caps doing well, financials doing well, all the cyclicals doing well. All of these areas were performing incredibly well and at the same time paused at the exact same moment back in March. And one of the interesting elements to ask here is, is that if the reflation trade is starting up again and this was just a pause, then is this the buy on dip in in all of those sectors. And one of the things that I'm going to be watching is whether or not this value over momentum starts to break out again after this retracement. And uh, I think that's going to be a, a one of the places to see it. Another place to also see that is on page six when we look at small caps over NASDAQ. And small caps as well were material outperformers during that, that uh, November through March uh, reflation impulse. And uh, over the last uh, you know, six weeks, the Russell simply has not even moved. It's been basically flat while we've seen a substantial amount of inflow, particularly to those FANG stocks. So we saw a lot of uh, uh, the technology names doing very well, and that caused this to pull back. But uh, the interesting question to, uh, that I'm going to be watching for is, uh, do we see now money coming back into the small caps? Are we going to see the small caps actually start to perform again? And so these are the kind of areas where some new money flow may start to emerge if, in fact, uh, the, this reflation trade is working. And the last uh, chart in that same sequence is looking at the energy space. So those cyclicals and deep value, uh, the energy fit the category for both of those. And what we saw was an extraordinary rally in those energy companies from November through to to March. And similarly, like we were talking about in last week's chart deck when we were with Art, many of these energy sectors have uh, gone through a considerable consolidation for the last six weeks. And if uh, oil's breaking out with the whole commodity cycle, uh, are we going to see another full leg higher in this energy space? And is this the beginning of a new opportunity in the space? Well, Patrick, if the question is whether or not the reflation trade is resuming, it seems to me we ought to look at what inflation break-evens are telling us, because that's the, the best predictor of where inflation's headed. And sure enough, you've got a chart of that on page eight. That's right. And so this is uh, just uh, supporting the idea 
that in fact, uh, what we've seen, not only have we seen in the last month the U.S. dollar backing off, but we have seen those commodity indices break out. And that certainly creates short-term transitory inflation pressure. And it's starting to really reflect on the uh, the 10-year break-evens. And so we're seeing inflation expectations once again breaking out uh, to give clues that maybe this trade is back on. You know, uh, I always I don't, don't like to over get excited about a new trade trend just a several days into it when something breaks out like this. But it, we have to pay attention. This is certainly the conditions that are supporting more of the same from what we've seen in the last six months well, since November. I don't think Charlie used the expression fear the steepener in this interview, but he certainly said that before. And um, boy, the, the steepener of the 2s 10s Treasury yield curve on page nine looks like it's resuming too. Right. It echoes the chart of just the 10-year Treasury yield because the, the Fed really does have the front of the curve pinned. And so uh, this is really bear steepening with a really almost everything being coming from where longer-term interest rates are. But one way or another, if we have um, this uh, yield curve break out again, the 10-year, I mean, we haven't really seen the 530s break out in any meaningful way. But if we see a resumption in the steepening, uh, it's certainly certainly will uh, put some uh, tailwind behind financials, which have actually been doing very well as well throughout this entire cycle. And so this uh, this is all um, things that are supportive of this idea. And so the big question, of, especially when we're talking about asset allocation, is, is about whether or not the reflation trade stopped in March and it was over, or was it just a pause and are, we're about to re-resume this trade? And if it is, then uh, this is where we have to put a lot of capital to work because this is where uh, there was going to be money flow. Well, and it also begs the question, particularly for gold investors, Patrick, of if this uh, trend is going to continue, is part of the reflation trade going to include increasing 10-year treasury yields, which we know it can really just cripple the price of gold. And sure enough, I guess great minds think alike. In the very next slide, you've got that question. Does that mean gold is going to underperform again? What are your thoughts? Well, you know, you you were talking about uh, treasury yields, but it's important to add the word real because uh, the correlation that uh, most people track is about the real yields, not nominal. And what's particularly interesting here, Eric, is, is that we haven't really seen real yields move yet. And so while we've certainly seen inflation expectations increase, we have definitely seen that start to impact 10-year treasury yields on a nominal basis and commodities running and all of of these different things are underway. But one of the things that I'm watching here is, well, what if um, that doesn't result in real yields actually rising? And I mean, we're, we're right now uh, basically at uh, negative 78 basis points. But if we see that uh, 10-year treasury yields stay somewhat contained, maybe it's not as bearish for gold as many think, because generally, I think financial repression is here to stay. And uh, while there could be short-term trend impulses in this, I mean, I think a, a lot of it will be in the nominal yields and in the CPI numbers, but it may not necessarily reflect in real Real yield. So it may not be as bearish for gold as it was the first go around. You know, what I circled here was really um, where gold has, uh, was the most under pressure after a, a real yields collapsed back in uh, June, July was where the big meaningful rally in gold happened, where we peaked out north of 2000. But uh, after a real, the rate of change of real yields really stalled out, gold really began consolidating off of its highs and that uh, that big jump in real yields back in February that saw us go from minus 1% to like uh, almost a minus 50 basis points and that, and that didn't make it quite there but uh, that was really that last breakdown in gold that that drove that push down towards uh, under 1700 and so you know if if real yields here stay far more range bound then I, maybe uh, maybe gold is not going to be as bearish even if there is a, a reflation cycle ahead. Patrick, when we got to the part of the interview with Charlie McElligot where we were talking about 
various different asset classes, and particularly the gamma and the options market, and specifically this gamma flip phenomenon, where what was a tailwind turns into a headwind and changes how it affects trends. Um, that's a, a topic that I know you've covered quite a bit in the past. Can you give our listeners just a quick refresher on that? Because I don't think it was completely clear from Charlie's discussion as to what this gamma flip thing is all about. For sure. And so let's go right down to the basics because uh, for, for some of our listeners, uh, just even understanding gamma in itself is, is a, it seems like a foreign word to them. You want to step back and just reflect upon the fact that most securities have a delta of one and a very linear relationship with price changes. And so to kind of give it an example, a delta one stock position where you're long a security, a $1 rise in the security is a $1 profit for you. It's a 45 degree angle and a very linear line. Options have a curve to this delta and that's the convexity that comes in options. And as a, a call or a put option are moving along that curve, they're changing at the rate of gamma. And so gamma is, is this element that we as options traders are looking at uh, is the sensitivity of particular options and, and the delta is telling us how much an option is changing relative to changes in the price of the underlying. What it really comes down to is this. What I have here on page 14 is the dealer gamma chart that Charlie has put on. What is showing at the zero line is just understanding it's about dealers and how they're positioned on their books. And so the way uh, you want to think of it is, is that in the market, actually, if, you, if we jump to slide 18, where we show the natural vol skew of the market, what we're actually showing is that put options are generally far more expensive and call options are far cheaper based upon the implied volatility being priced. And one of the reasons that this exists in the marketplace is because generally investors are sellers of call premium above and uh, uh, basically option overriders for premium harvesting and they're buyers of insurance and protection for downside market moves. And this creates that skew and generally dealers find themselves in a situation where they are short a whole whack of put options and they tend to be long a whole series of call options in, on their books. And what uh, Charlie is always trying to do is assess what impact this has on the dealer and how the dealer, with the goal of being neutral on their options book, how many futures they're going to be buying or selling in order for them to hedge their risks. And so uh, what we're looking at really is anticipating price distribution. What ends up happening is that when the gamma positive on Charlie's charts. What it's actually showing us is that the markets are generally mean reverting in that period, which is, is that uh, dealers will have all their futures positions to delta uh, hedge themselves to neutral. And when it's positive or in that green box, it results in dealers generally selling into rallies and by more importantly, buying into dips, making them generally contribute to suppressing volatility. And so this is a period where the market generally has uh, somewhat of an upward trajectory, especially from different, uh, more advanced option Greeks like Vanna and, and Gary and all these other influences that come in the market. But what is most important is noting where the gamma flip is. And the gamma flip is where he has that red box, which he marks off as the 4,044 level on the S&P. And what, uh, what he's highlighting in that is, is that that's where all of those put options that the dealers are generally short start uh, influencing the dealer's behavior. And what ends up happening is that during the, uh, the positive gamma period uh, where dealers were suppressing volatility, now dealers are being forced to sell into weakness and subsequently buy into strength, which then actually makes them actually increase volatility in the market or fuel it versus before they were suppressing it. And so generally this causes volatilities to rise, volatility targeting funds start to sell, and it often can create a feedback mechanism that can actually spur on bigger market corrections. And so noting where the level is, is sort of an idea of knowing where markets can really start getting 
very choppy and the dispersion of price movement can get quite violent. Okay, Patrick. So the big picture here is we have an options market. The dealers who buy and sell those options for a living are forced to buy and sell stock index futures. So they're basically buying and selling the stock market in order to hedge and balance their risk exposure. That's just part of what they do systematically all day long. Most of the time, and this is what the green box represents, the actions that they do systematically dampen the volatility that we see in markets because they're buying the dips and they're selling the peaks. And it automatically just makes the market uh, a more comfortable, relaxed place because there's less volatility. But there's a certain regime that once you cross into it, and that's the red box, what happens is the actions the dealers are forced to take are making the situation worse, not better. They're not buying the dips, they're selling the dips, and they're buying the peaks, exacerbating volatility in the market, and as you put it, potentially creating a runaway situation that becomes self-reinforcing, and that's how we get a crash. Is that the gist of it? That is the gist of it. And so when we go into onto page 15, this is just the VIX or the volatility index. Generally, when you see those big spikes in the VIX, often those are the sign that those dealers are now actually creating uh, as that price distribution widens and the day-to-day -day volatility becomes bigger then what you end up seeing is is that they have to price that at higher volatility into the options and it just creates a feedback mechanism that creates these big spikes in volatility and so that's uh, and that's generally the story and so when we're here on page 15 looking at the vix one of the more interesting patterns that we've seen while in the pre-COVID period, we saw that short gamma regime really have suppressed implied volatilities that were as low as 10 or 12 on the VIX. Uh, that really has not been back since COVID came around. But what is interesting is, is really uh, since the middle of March till present, we have seen for the first time volatility come back into the teens. And we, we've had a, a sustained period of high volatility volatility where 2021 was the lower boundary of volatility. And so, uh, so now one of the things that happens with, uh, with this is that as volatility is contracting, there's this influence on dealers called VANA, which basically means that all these out-of-the-money options as volatility contracts have less delta and therefore dealers need less hedges. And there are, it actually once again becomes a tailwind for the markets to actually uh, feed even further support to the markets rising. And so we've had this really crazy period in the markets where everything has been working right for the market. Everything's been a tailwind. And I think one of the most interesting things to watch for in the coming weeks and months is when will this kind of positive feedback mechanism run out of momentum? When, when we, do we reach that point where all of these things that have been tailwind for the market just aren't there or is not remotely as strong anymore? And will that ultimately be where a bigger market correction can ensue? You. And that's uh, it's going to be one of the more interesting things to see. If we move on to page 16, Charlie was talking about the uh, VVIX, which was the, the VIX volatility index, which is volatility of volatility, like how much premium comes on options on volatility itself. And again, we're just at low end ranges of even that. And so right now, volatility continues to contract. No one seems to be worried about too much here. Everyone has a, is quite complacent about things staying the same. And uh, that always makes me at least a little nervous, but that's just the trader in me. But but one way or another, this is the reality of where we are in this market condition. The one final thing that I wanted to touch on on page 17 here, Eric, was that um, I just wanted to show what has been contributing to that lower implied volatility. So the white uh, squiggly line on here is the actual implied volatility of the uh, S&P 500 options, which is right now around 14.2 on, uh, on this chart. But what you can observe here is when we look at the actual realized volatility on a 10-day and 30-day period, we're down to single digits, like 8.8 and 9.7%. And so while it looks like that these implied volatilities are really low, 
realized volatility is even lower, which generally has been uh, what has been driving lower volatility and actually being this tailwind. But realistically, once we're down into these single digit levels, it doesn't get much better than this. I seriously, I don't, it's going to be hard pressed for us, think, I think, for us to see, you know, numbers that let's say go down under 7% on a sustained basis. So, so at some stage, we're reaching the lower boundary of a lot of these zones. And, and, it's, and that to me, at least for this part of the market that has been contributing to helping the market rally, it's dissipating or it's at least running out of juice. I, and it'll be really interesting to see if there's something else that can really become a new tailwind for the stock market, because I don't think this is going to be contributing much longer. And folks, don't forget, you can get Patrick's Chart Decks not just once a week, but every day if you want to by signing up for a free trial of Big Picture Trading, Patrick's service. Details are on page 19 or at bigpicturetrading.com. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by freelancer.com, the Internet's premier website for putting independent freelance contractors in touch with employers who need their services. Patrick, tell them what's in this week's Research Roundup. Well, this week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to Charlie McElligot's slides and in the chart book we just discussed here in the post game. There's also a link to a Jesse Felder article, What the Boom in Fraud Says About the Current Market Environment, Part 2, as well as a link to a Jeffrey Snyder article on another $100 trillion for the library. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter, and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend, that's Eric spelled with a K, and myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>